<laughs> uh, hey, we got a boom mic this time. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome again, everybody, or anybody who might be watching, to uh, once again to Cast Iron Wednesday, where, as we say every time, <laughs> um, yeah, it's Wednesday, and a lot of the uh, smaller YouTube channels, including mine, uh, like to uh, you know have something of a tradition going of uh, cooking in cast iron on on Wednesday. Um, the larger channels, even though, again, I say this every week, the larger channels just seem to ignore this. Uh, but a lot of the smaller channels have made it uh, something of a tradition, and I very much enjoy it as well, partly because I enjoy these uh, smaller uh, cooking channels. I suppose mine is one of them. And um, what can I say? It's fun, and hey, any excuse to cook in cast iron is a good thing. Uh, furthermore, people know what to expect because it's cast iron Wednesday. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, again. Again, welcome back, and as I mentioned, the uh, title of uh, this week's uh, little chat <laughs> is we are talking about UFOs, uh, at which point you can start uh, with your uh, X-Files uh, theme music playing here. I'd play it myself, except that I'd probably get flagged for copyright here on YouTube. <laughs> and of course, naturally, when we talk about UFOs here, we are talking about unidentified frying objects. Um, which means, of course, those unknown uh, cast iron pans that uh, are actually quite common. And there's a good chance that you, one of you folks watching this right now, could have one or more of these kind of pans in your uh, kitchen as well. And they are, in fact, uh, unknown in that the maker of these uh, pans, or makers, I should say, uh, they're, well, the actual origin of these pans have been lost over the uh, course of history. I mean, after all, cast iron has been around in, um, in the United States for a good 200 years or more. And there were many small uh, businesses, foundries, manufacturers, and so forth that sprung up for a short period of time or even a longer period of time, but eventually ended up folding or going out of business and their records were simply lost. Or indeed, they may have even had uh, factory fires where, again, a lot of their uh, crucial records literally went up in smoke. And because of this, a lot of uh, the evidence really that points to exactly who made pans like this, such as this uh, ugly hammered number five skillet here, are, uh, well, your guess is as good as mine. Folks have been uh, researching uh, these uh, pans, especially over the past decade or so with the uh, boom in cast iron uh, cooking that <clears throat> really has, uh, you know, there's been a great resurgence and a great interest in cast iron. And among other things, of course, that has made cast iron, vintage cast iron pans in general more and more collectible and valuable. And of course, where there's money involved, People are uh, really doing a lot more digging now than they used to back in the past when these things were considered just a frying pan. <laughs> and so uh, once again, as you know, it's YouTube Live. And thank you again to everybody who shows up, including our regulars here. It seems like like Fluffy Otter and the Shadow Walker. And, uh, and hello, John. Hello, I made it on time tonight. Congratulations. And Miss French Twist is here. And William Hurt. And um, let me see. So far, I haven't yet seen Papa Dan. I expect he'll probably show up any moment. So <laughs> William Hurt. Um, my first Dutch oven is so smooth and perfect. I thought it was vintage American. When I became aware of such things, I found out it was uh, it was Taiwan. What do you know? Well, hey, there's actually nothing wrong with those particular uh, pans, and I know which ones you're talking about. Those ones that say made in Taiwan, and they've got kind of like rounded or concave uh, handles, and they were part of that uh, kitchen set of those um, <clears throat> wooden handled uh, saucepans, and even uh, one wooden handled. Uh, well, skillet uh, that were all made in Taiwan anywhere from, say, the 1970s to the 1980s or so. And they um, are very widely well known. And that particular uh, Dutch oven is likely a uh, part of that set as well. And, of course, yeah, it's a little beauty. Likewise, Shadow Walker, uh, he, I can't pronounce it. Uh, he says here, I've read that it was not common for companies to brand at all. 
Uh, that's a relatively modern thing to brand products. Well, it depends on which brands we're talking about. I mean, after all, all we almost all we hear about naturally when it comes to vintage cast iron, especially on eBay, are the ones with the brands, namely Griswold, Wagner. Um, those, are, of course, are the big names in vintage cast iron, and those are the ones that, that get all the big bucks. You go to any uh, antique, uh, antique mall, for instance, prices are going up. So an unknown uh, cast iron pan like this one could very well be uh, sitting on a shelf for like about uh, $25. And yeah, that's overpriced. Whereas meanwhile, next to it would be a Griswold of the same size or smaller that would almost certainly be double this price. Um, in fact, I guess I should mention as well, on the uh, YouTube description of this video, I do include uh, some links to a few eBay uh, listings. Those are not my listings. I am not selling those pans. And in fact, I do not recommend that you buy those pans that are uh, there in those listings. I think they're all overpriced. However, they all have some very nice photographs of uh, some, uh, some of the uh, more well, well-known UFOs, I guess you could say, of these of these kinds. You know, things like a Southern Mystery skillet, an unhammer, a um, a blank and chip style combo cooker. Uh, the photos in those particular eBay uh, listings are pretty good. And so, as examples of uh, what they are, well, again, um, as I said, I encourage you to look at them. But really, the prices they have there are. Are uh, oh yeah, they are uh, much overpriced, and I would not recommend uh, getting uh, those kind of things at that price. Not unless you absolutely feel. Yeah, I've already uh, opened there's the car. window. Well, there's a car driver on this backfire, and it sounded like. Oh, nice. So, well, well, if that happens, I'll just let people know. There's a car in the neighborhood that's driving around and backfiring. So we might, yeah, gunshot. yeah, we might hear something that's like gunshot, but with any luck. It's not. Yeah, we've had some shootings in our, 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 our close area, unfortunately. Yeah. What about but it's young kids? Yeah. What about what about Glock thirty fan? Well, hopefully he'll show up. And yeah, I, I had heard about that. So yeah, yeah, kids, yeah. they're all under 20, 16, 18, and nineteen. Yeah, this is not the best neighborhood. No. I am looking for another place. Who knows? Hopefully, we'll yeah. get one soon. But anyway, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are the Asian gate mark as old as American made gate mark? Um, I would say on one hand, probably not. On the other hand, of course, you know, they've been making cast iron pans in Asia for literally centuries, uh, if not the past couple of thousand years. Although it's not very likely that you're going to come across a 2000 year old cast iron pan at a, at a flea market. <laughs> um, <clears throat> On the other hand, you could argue that they used more cheaper methods uh, in those, uh, you know, in those areas because, of course, those foundries have been around for well, maybe even centuries. Um, and I'll only say this once because this is not really the subject of this video. Um, even though they do use cheaper methods, and yes, Asian cast iron pans are often rough and uh, look rough, they're still fine for cooking. Um, they are not contaminated with lead or chemicals or depleted uranium or anything like that. And um, Asian made cast iron, if some folks have uh, their own personal or political reasons to avoid Asian made cast iron, you are, of course, free to do so for your own reasons. I mean, I'm not here to change anybody's mind or, or force them to follow uh, some kind of pol politics or not. But on the other hand, even if you don't like Asian cast iron, they are still safe for cooking. So... And yeah, here's Papa Dan. Hi, uh, CSC and Jamie. Hello, I finally made it. Yay. William Hurt again. The lid looks like a perfect fit, too, with dimples for auto basting. Yeah, I, I, I kind of recognize that. Well, has F wait a second, FBP. Um, if it says FBP, that might actually be a BSR because they uh, actually made two versions of the FBP. In the early days, it was uh, considered simply a flat bottom pot. And in the later days, they actually uh, gave it a cuter name, the Franklin Bean Pot. You might want to post photos of that. I mean, I may be wrong and that might actually be a BSR. So anyway, but back to the subject here. And in fact, let's turn this uh, camera over to something more interesting than my face here. Namely, 
here we go again. Um, the, yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, I made a first attempt at uh, doing a live video on this subject, and we were, and I unfortunately kind of blew it. This time, I'm doing my best, of course, not to have any uh, disruptions like that. And that, and here we are again with me, with a uh, with this fancy handled um, 19th century uh, cast iron pan, and that's what they call these things. They actually call them fancy handle pans because again they are unknown nobody really knows who made them and it's a it's a pretty good description these things are very light um especially for cast iron and they've got this wonderful uh, design on the handle this particular line of the uh, kit pans with the fancy handle it's theorized that maybe they came from the same manufacturer but because there are no markings at all on it nobody can say really where they came from um, and having said that, let me check one thing. Paw Paw Dan lost connection from a, oh, that reminds me. Oh my God. I forgot one crucial thing. I'm running on Wi-Fi here. Give me a quick second. I apologize for the delay. It's always something, but I want to be sure that we don't have an interruption. Give me a second. I can't believe I forgot the cable. Oh, my mind is going. Every week, and I just simply forgot this time. Oh, somebody, never mind. I'm almost there, folks. Thank you again for your patience. And having done that, let us plug in. Ah, there we go. <laughs> You reminded me by saying that it seemed to uh, lock up or uh, freeze for a moment here. So, and I can't believe I forgot this. I've been doing this every week now, and I just plain forgot. I was running on Wi-Fi, but now we've got an Ethernet connection. So, again, with any luck, there should not be any interruptions. Anyway, um, do you receive fan mail? Well, I wouldn't exactly call it fan mail, but I do appreciate emails from folks. <laughs> I'm from Canada, I have a wonderful Canadian pen. Um, wow. <laughs> well, I do know that somebody has kept asking if I have ever cooked in a, in a smart. Um, I'll have to uh, get back to you on that because, well, again, I, I would I very much appreciate the offer. Um, I will have to, uh, I'll have to look that over. <laughs> Um, just send, uh, send an email to my email address, please, I guess, motomac at motomac.com. But anyway, um, <clears throat> okay. Now, like I said, we've wasted enough time. Let's uh, get some. Let's get down to a little bit of cooking, shall we? Because, well, again, that is the whole point here—to have some fun with cast iron. Um, this thing here is a real spinner, too. I mean, it is actually quite warped. Uh, but there's really nothing wrong with that. And one reason why, of course, is because it's so light and thin. And who can say what it went through? And now, anyway, the cooking tonight is also going to be uh, pretty easy. As I mentioned, we're doing SOS, but we're not just doing um, doing it on a shingle with some bread. I'm actually doing um, something else that is uh, quite common, and that is throwing in uh, a few of these uh, frozen hash browns here. I know that's kind of like a sin. It seems like every video of uh, doing hash browns, here we go. By the way, notice I'm not even using oil here because... I'm cooking these frozen, and so, yeah, I mean, oil and water don't mix, as you know, so I really don't think I'd be able to uh, do oil in this pan. All I can... Fan, 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 fan. All right, one second again. All right, okay, the fan is on. mic on the other side, then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I should probably ask, as as she said, if the fan is disturbing the sound or not. Besides, these things are pretty much pre-cooked anyway, and all we have to do is preheat them. But like I said, you know, I mean, yeah. Rather than taking the time, I guess, to do all of this from scratch, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's probably better than these things. I mean, I mean, everybody uh, cooks these uh, frozen uh, hash browns once in a while, and there's really nothing wrong with them. So. 
I figured we would do this and then we will make some uh, gravy, some hamburger gravy, and then uh, top that. I mean, I've got some, I have bread as well, but hey, I mean, why not have it on top of hash browns? <laughs> so, um, hello, Jessica. Yeah, the fancy handle pan looks lightweight. It is. It's extremely light and thin. It's one of the lightest cast iron pans I've ever held. I will say that. I mean, it's still cast iron. It still has some heft to it, but it is much thinner and lighter than uh, really even most uh, most vintage skillets. This particular one here is actually a number nine size, and I found that out because it fits a Griswold number nine lid perfectly which is a little unusual. Nonetheless, um, as I mentioned, these, uh, these, of course, again, these particular pans, these were actually meant as throwaway items, which is why this is so light and thin and why it has no markings at all on it. Um, again, the idea back then in the uh, late 1800s was that cooking stoves were really taking off. You know, they would, were really becoming popular and um, and everybody was uh, buying one for their kitchen. And so, of course, the sellers really wanted to uh, put an incentive with uh, buying wood burning uh, for people who buying wood burning stoves in those days. And so it was fairly common practice with most manufacturers that uh, they would actually do uh, do a whole set of uh, cookware. Um, for, to uh, go with the stove, and that when you bought the stove, you would also get a whole set of uh, cookware as an accessory to go with it, which was especially uh, appealing considering that, you know, before people got a stove, they were cooking in the hearth, they were cooking in the fireplace, you know, with, with uh, hanging pots and uh, spiders. So, yeah, having a flat bottom pan was, uh, really, was a real incentive then. And, of course, they would uh, mark those pans very simply to uh, have them as part of a set. So that, for instance, I mean, here is a very, you know, here's a very common uh, gate mark pan. Again, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, have a, a pan like this, and you would certainly recognize it from the very attractive and simple handle. It is, of course, gate marked, and it simply has a letter A on the bottom, which uh, likely means that this is probably a uh, part of a, you know, part of a set. So that the small, the small skillet was an A, a larger skillet was probably B, a uh, desktop, no, stove top kettle was C, and so on. Really depended on the manufacturer and the seller, of course. They probably were even able to mix and match them. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, links I have, in addition. On the uh, video, on the <clears throat> on the description of this video, was one for what they what you see as a bulge kettle, and that was also a very common stovetop kettle that uh, was usually some part of these uh, accessories here. All of which are very thin and light, uh, much more so than Dutch ovens or or fancier skillets. Uh, which, incidentally, as as somebody mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, um, we um, it was in the uh, 1880s or so when the Griswold Company first started actually putting their logo on their pans. So yeah, right from the beginning, Griswold was considered to be the elite, you know, the best of the best when it came to uh, uh, cast iron cookware. And so you do, and so folks went out of their way to get something as fancy as a Griswold. On the other hand, again, these simple cheap frying pans were so were uh, so common that um, you know, as I said, they were considered to be throwaways. And yet, quite a few they made so many of these that a lot of these pans have outlived the stoves themselves. <laughs> so people are still cooking on these uh, gate mark pans even today. You know, we're talking like maybe anywhere between a hundred to hundred fifty years later, whereas the wood burning stoves are unfortunately, mostly gone. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, even on the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook, people use these uh, unknown pans, uh, these uh, gate mark pans, on a very regular basis. So uh, another, gate mark, another uh, gate mark piece in addition to this was uh, a, um, another piece was um, a, gr a long griddle with a gate mark, and I have a uh, link to that on the uh, site, on the uh, description of this video as well. And let me see one other thing. I need to quickly grab a plate here for these things. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, a long gate mark griddle, which actually was usually not an actual griddle. You, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen or maybe even used those very thin and light uh, oval-shaped uh, platters there. Yeah, you're right. I I'll turn it down a little bit. Yeah. And then, but anyway, as I said, those were not actually made as griddles. Those are, in fact, sad iron heaters. They were meant as heaters uh, in that you would heat them up to uh, heat your, you know, your uh, clothes irons. But, of course, there's really nothing wrong with using those things as griddles, and they, and they work just fine. But that's the reason why they are so thin and light, and also the reason why a lot of them have just that they have uh you know little rims around the side which which in, can make it a little difficult at times to uh remove uh food from the pan so we've got a couple here and i'll do two more of these and then we will get down to making us some gravy there we go as i said these things are frozen and again, that's why I'm not using oil here in this case, really doing nothing more than just heating it up. And what else do we have for comments here? Papa Dan got two fancy handle number seven riddles. One a lot smaller than the other and not the same manufacturer. Oh, I don't doubt it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with those size numbers. If you, uh, look, I mean... Anybody who uh, gets into uh, cooking with cast iron learns very quickly those size numbers are almost worthless. They're really more of an estimate than anything else. They were, of course, meant for, uh, originally based on wood-burning stoves, which meant, of course, that a number eight pan would fit in a stove with a number eight sized eye. Uh, there was very little standardization, and as Paw Paw Dan noted, notes the same size number was different with uh, different manufacturers and that continued all the way through the 20th century where as we know say for instance while Wagner Griswold and Lodge were roughly the same size and you can even use Lodge lids on all three of them uh, one of our other favorites from the 20th century Birmingham stove and range they were made their pans just slightly bigger which I believe was a selling point, in fact. You know, you could get a slightly bigger pan at that price. But, of course, that also meant that they are not compatible, unfortunately, with lids from Lodge or Griswold or Wagner or anything like that. At least not until they changed their size in the 70s. So, <laughs> um, Hunter 45, is cast iron better with gas or, or an electric stove? I would... I'm, I would probably say gas, but I ha since I learned to cook just over 10 years ago, I have unfortunately lived in, in homes that only have electric stoves. So all of my cooking has been, well, the vast majority of my cooking has been on electric. And I've learned a lot about it. And in fact, if I can finally score an apartment that has a gas stove, I realize there's going to be a learning curve as I'm going to have to learn really how to cook every day on gas. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But nonetheless, though, um, yeah, cast iron certainly helps even with a wimpy electric stove like mine in that you can still do things like get you get a good sear or a browning on your, uh, on your food, for instance. Uh, I want hash brown. Yeah, so do I. So, and as Jennifer Diamond said, gas all day long. <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, those are, uh, again, those were the gate marked uh, 19th century uh, pans, and they are, again, unknown because they came from many different manufacturers. The, uh, a lot of them had that same fancy handle to it, you know, this teardrop handle here. With the size number on it, even if the, even if the actual size differed from uh, one manufacturer to another, um, it's theorized that uh, that probably there were some generic um, patterns used for making cast iron pans that went around for you know that went uh, through for manufacturers. They could have borrowed each other's patterns or or just plain copied them, but nonetheless, that's why. 
that uh, teardrop pattern, again, was uh, used by many different manufacturers, and which, again, means that those pans, that those pans again, are practically unidentifiable because, well, who knows who made them? Any number of uh, manufacturers, many of whom are long gone, could have made them. For all we know, for instance, well, yeah, I'm sure there were some companies as well that only made cast iron pans. Well, yes, there were, like Griswold, for instance, to supplement those cooking stoves. Of course, those ones would almost certainly have put their own logo or manufacturer name on them. Some of those pans from the, uh, 19, from the uh, 19th century do have a manufacturer name on them. Not many, but some. Uh, it seems like the kettles and the Dutch ovens had them more often, which again, I mentioned that link to that stovetop kettle there. That stovetop kettle is interesting in itself in that, well, they often sell these things on eBay with the, calling it a cauldron, for instance, or a gypsy pot, which I think, in fact, is what they call it in that um, in that eBay listing. Of course, you know, pretty much they use all the fancy names, really, just to, uh, you know, just to uh, entice people to buy it in the hope that it's uh, more attractive that way. In pretty much the same way that whenever you go to a um, antique mall, you will see a tiny little cast iron, toy cast iron stove. And in fact, it was a toy but very rarely will the seller call it a toy. It will always be labeled a salesman sample. <laughs> and while there were some salesman samples, those are extremely rare. Whereas, on the other hand, there seem to be thousands of salesman sample stoves all over the country in just about every antique mall you can think of. <laughs> Almost as if they did not want to use the word toy. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, it's in a, grew up in a gas home, Glock 30 pan. Welcome again, and thank you, and thank you for showing up again. Are there any older companies that are still around? Um, Lodge. Lodge Cast Iron, of course. You know, they are uh, doing a big deal of celebrating their 125th anniversary this year. Um, it's really tough to think of any other company, quite frankly, because, again, Lodge is the last of the... Uh, of the vintage American cast iron manufacturers. I mean, we've got all of these new companies that have just shown up uh, within the past decade or so, but Lodge is the only only one, the only vintage manufacturer that survived. I have to say that they're all gone. Um, some, okay, one I can think of would be Volrath. Volrath uh, cast iron pans are fairly well known to collectors. They're kind of rare, especially compared to things like uh, Lodge, or Wagner, or the like, but they're out there. Volrath, on the other hand, they stopped making cast iron somewhere around uh, the ninth, somewhere around World War II, or just after it. And instead, instead of going for the home cookware market like that, they became instead a business supplier. And uh, they've done pretty well. In fact, they are a major name. You go to any restaurant store these days, and you will find Volrath equipment. Uh, of all kinds, including aluminum uh, frying pans and and uh, saucepans and the like, which are Asian made. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, the uh, the Volrath company is still around, even if they have not made cast iron since again since at least uh, at the latest by World War II. Uh, I cannot think of any other manufacturer who has unfortunately survived. Um, ABI, American, oh, I forget what ABI stands for now. I should know this because they're actually a maker of, of uh, plumbing, pipes, and other uh, necessities. ABI, for a very brief time, I think maybe like 1970s or 1980s, they made a few cast iron pans, not many, but a few. And if you ever see an ABI uh, pan out there, it's uh, really quite a collector's item. On the other hand, there were also some 19th century uh, manufacturers that uh, made quite a few pans with their own marking on them that, uh, unfortunately, they disappeared even before the 20th century. One I'm thinking of is the Marietta foundry of uh, Pennsylva in Pennsylvania. There are quite a few Marietta uh, pans and pots out there. 
Um, but as I said, they did not even make it to the uh, 20th century. Another one I can think of from the 19th century was w was the Wrought Iron Company, Wirco, W-I-R-C-O. And when looking for um, 19th century cast iron, you you I may take some searching, but it's not that hard to find one of the, one of uh, their pieces. And with that, I think we've got ourselves a couple. Ooh, yeah, ouch! Oh, great. That went, that went great. <laughs> I accidentally touched my, uh, you know, just barely touched my finger against this hot pan and just jerked it. Oh, well. Oh, there it goes again. Watch yourself. I'm talking to my Right. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, no, I mean, figure these things are frozen and they're coated with ice. And you know what happens when water hits oil? It's, it's all right. I just work in a, it's, They're frozen in McDonald's, too. And they're going to fry later. No. Yeah, you're good. Okay, well, nonetheless. And I know. Though, yeah, you know, okay, right? nonetheless, yeah. the I don't think these things turned no, out too badly. Yeah. yeah. That's when you get to, that's the crispy outside. So we'll have to show, I'll, we'll, okay. we'll try that next time, folks. All right, we'll try that next time. Yeah. Nonetheless, now that we've done that, we can get down to some, uh, making some gravy, as promised. Let's see what else we have in the comments here, though. Um, I picked up an AVI pan with a lid a few months ago. Oh, congratulations, before in 73. Like I said, you get yourself a bit of collector's item there. Uh, Jimmy Lankford got a gate mark number seven fancy handle skillet for ten dollars. Ten dollars, does that say? Now, just restored. If so, well, then again, congratulations on that. Um, what size is your AVI? That's it, American Brass and Iron. Thank you, thank you very much for that. So okay and what's to say something about william oh yeah william and your mom was an angel <laughs> yeah congratulations william okay now that we've wasted enough time let's actually get down to this uh and that of course would be time to throw in some ground beef and get started here that's one nice thing about using a large pan like this for the record you know if you crowd the pan too much it will give off a lot of excess liquid. Fortunately, this particular pan is big enough that um, I can throw in a whole pound of beef like I did just now. And um, while it is, of course, going to release some liquid and grease because it is ground beef, it's too big enough that I'm not really crowding the pan, even despite what we're, despite the fact that I threw in a whole pound of it here. And while we're doing that, let me bring up that other uh, subject, as I mentioned, uh, other unknown cast iron pans. Uh, in addition to these uh, gate mark skillets, the other ones that are actually fairly common, at least in terms of vintage cast iron, but still unknown, would be the SMS, namely the Southern Mystery Skillets. And... Any, and yeah, again, there's a good chance that you've uh, come across one of those at some point or another. I have a link to one of them on my uh, on the description of this video uh, already. I will say again, I'll repeat myself, I am not selling those eBay listings myself. And actually, I do not recommend buying those one eBay listings that I have listed there. I think they're all overpriced. But they have some nice photos there, including that one of a Southern mystery skillet. Those ones, and I have, I'm guilty of this myself, are often mistaken for very early first generation lodge or even black lock pans because the first generation lodge and apparently black lock, I think black lock was gate marked in fact, but at least the first generation lodge, they look very, very similar to uh, those ones. You know, they have a raised size number on the handle and uh, they are, and just that, they are very thick and heavy. Uh, the underside of the handle of that SMS skillet there, though, does have something like a uh, fin shape on it. And uh, Lodge Pans never did have that kind of a handle. So that's one clue at, that that is not a, uh, an original Lodge skillet. But especially for that reason, that's why I know I would not pay that kind of a price for a uh, Southern Mystery Skillet. Not unless you felt you absolutely needed one for whatever reason. Nonetheless, those were very common 
Um, and the reason why they're called Southern Mystery Skillets is, is that a lot of them seem to originate from the um, Southern portion of the uh, U.S. And so, hence the name Southern Mystery Skillet. Now I get to, now I can turn this uh, heat up a little bit so that we can get this, uh, gir get these burgers here nice and well done. Well, yeah, actually, because... Again, you don't want any pink in, the, in when you're cooking ground beef like this. And let's see what else we have here. I found the pan one week, and then about three weeks later, the lid. Well, that one at the same flea market, different sellers. What was the chances? Yeah, I know. That was actually quite amazing there. Well, again, all I can say is congratulations to you for that. What I also found when cooking ground beef in particular is that, yes, it does release liquid, but if you just keep on cooking it, the liquid will evaporate. All we need is a little bit of patience, as Guns N' Roses said. But nonetheless, as we mentioned, Southern Mystery Skillets, um, they are... A lot of them, even though, yeah, just about all of them seem to be in a, uh, have a size 8 on the on the uh, handle. Uh, I Rarely, if ever, do you see a 9. I'm t I believe there may be a few 7s out there, but they're not very common. And yet, almost all of those uh, SMS pens, even though they say number 8 on the side, on the side, on the on the handle they are in fact rather smaller than a typical 20th century number eight size pan including a number eight size lodge you can usually take a uh, number eight um sms and easily place it inside uh say a lodge or a bsr number eight and there will be actually be some room left over so that's another clue as to uh spotting these um, they, as to who made them, well, as, as we said, we don't know. On one hand, there's the theory, you know, that there were, of course, a lot of small and independent foundries out there, although some of these look very well made, which comes to the other theory that has politics behind it, but I simply refuse to discuss these politics because I know very little about it, and that would be prison labor. Um, you know, the theory goes that a number of uh, prisons, uh, they actually farmed out their, uh, their uh, prisoners to different foundries um, at extremely cheap prices. You know, quite almost like, I shouldn't say slave labor, but more like, you know, indentured labor. Um, and my understanding is that there are records, for instance, that uh, Birmingham Stoven Range did, in fact, employ uh, prison workers on their line because, again, they were extremely cheap. But that is, again, another subject that I'm not going to get into because, you know, again, it's fraught with politics. And besides, what can you do about uh, the political situation from 100 years ago? I mean, it, it's not the same as, say, Nazi Germany, for instance. I mean, Nazi Germany, of course, they committed horrible crimes. And while, um, I mean, and again, while the use of prison labor was not, you know, obviously we really couldn't say it was ethical, it's not like I think that's enough of a reason to refuse to use, say, an SMS pan, which we don't even know was made in there. I mean, we really don't have any records of, of which of these were made by prison labor and which were not, so it's very, very sketchy. And that's about all I'm going to say about that subject, getting back to that. Well, on the other hand, the Southern Mystery Skillets, as I said, they are all, um, again, just like any cast iron pan, they are great cookers. And those of you who are using them, I very much encourage you to continue using them. And then from there, after Southern Mystery Skillets, oh, let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, old hags. I have to think there are some completionist cast iron collectors who will overpay to get an to get an odd pan. Oh, definitely. I mean, that's how, that's that's the collector's market for you. I mean, it's like you will go out of your way sometimes overpay for, especially because it's one you want. I mean, that's one reason why. I got a little ashtray skillet. Let me quickly bring that up here. That's why I kind of sort of overpaid 
for this Atlanta Stove Works ashtray skillet because I wanted this as, you know, as I'm a fan of Birmingham Stove and Range. Atlanta Stove Works was, of course, a parent company of BSR. And I, and I paid something like 20 bucks or so for a three set, this and a couple of other ashtray skillets, which I know was, I'm thinking that was still a nice deal. And we all have our guilty pleasures as far as that's concerned. And I'm not going to criticize anyone who does end up overpaying intentionally or otherwise. Because, hey, it's your business, your money. I'm not here to dictate to you. All I can do is offer some advice on what I personally feel might be a good bargain and might not. <laughs> and what else do we have here? Block 30 pen. Uh, is the single four spout common? No. Um, there are not many. I mean, um, obviously the double sport, the double pour spout is much, much more common. This one is a little unusual in that respect. In fact, I saw uh, this particular one, the uh, fancy, yeah, when you get into, say, 20th century uh, skillets, if you find one with a single pour spout, then yeah, that is a, a rare item, yes. But I mean, here's again... Who outside of collectors would really recognize something like that? That's one reason why you can still find bargains at the antique malls and the like. Okay, this is uh, getting to be nice and done at this point. Which means... Just throw in a little salt, a little bit of pepper. Now I get to add some more grease to the pan. Excuse me one more time. Because it's time to get some butter. They say the golden rule for um for a uh, good roux, and that would include for gravy, is equal amounts of fat and, um, mm, oh yeah, this is still hard, <laughs> equal amounts of fat and flour. And so here comes the fat. In a, oh, okay. treat, yeah. treat the food how you want to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, after all, once this thing is made, somebody's going to have to eat it. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good rule. <laughs> yes. Okay. John, John Blake cooking the ribeye in my secondhand forty dollar stargazer tonight. I'm frustrated with its reluctance to seasoning. But yeah, I know. I'm in the same boat too. You've seen my stargazer too. It does have some problems with the seasoning, and yet on the other hand. It's still a good cooker. I mean, it just does not look the greatest because the seasoning is not taking. And yet, as I'm sure you've seen, you know, it's nice and glass smooth and does a fine job cooking, which is why I still don't mind it. I think it might be a valid criticism to say that it has some trouble with the seasoning. But nonetheless, um, I am not, I'm still not complaining about uh, owning a Stargazer. And what else do we have here? Sometimes we've got to put out. Have it within budget myself. Yeah, that's the hard thing as well. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, you really can't go overboard too much. <sighs> I have splurged a few times when it comes to cast iron, like, um, for instance, so, for instance, um, I paid, I think I said this last week, in fact, I ended up paying $100 for my South African boiky pot because I wanted it. <laughs> And I don't regret it. I would still say, I mean, unless you have money to burn, it's not absolutely necessary to spend $100 on a uh, cast iron Dutch oven. Unless you absolutely have a need for it. <laughs> um, having said that, I mean, I've got, for instance, you have seen Stumpy, my uh, BSR number 14, who has done a great job. I'm, I've sometimes wondered what would happen if I found a Red Mountain, BSR Red Mountain number 14. Would I get it, even though I've got Stumpy? That's a tough call. 
but I guess I'll have to find out if I ever come across one of those. However, that's the thing. They sell those fairly often on eBay, again, at really, really high prices, and I have no need for it. Ooh, this smells nice with the butter, which means it's time now to go in the other direction and start adding flour. About a quarter cup. Let's start with that. With any luck, that's all that we should need. Because all we got to do is thicken it a little bit, and then we can start adding milk. It's going to be some nice hamburger gravy here, as any kid will tell you. Yeah, you always call it hamburgers. Yeah, actually, this is turning out good. Yeah, this is, as you can see, it's soaking up the uh, grease and the uh, liquid very nicely. So, yeah, I don't think we need any more than that quarter cup of, um, there we go, than that quarter cup of um, flour there. Even though we've got all that butter and the extra grease, I think this is doing pretty good. Okay, the old time pans were glass smooth and hold seasoning. Yeah, and some of the newer pans are also glass smooth and they hold seasoning. I think, unfortunately, regrettably, Stargazer made a mistake and simply made their pans too thin. Which is actually another reason why I am not a fan of grinding down rough cast iron, whether it's lodge or Asian or otherwise. Other folks have other opinions, and you are certainly free to do so. Because, again, it does not hold the seasoning very well. There are some YouTube videos where some guy will polish this skillet to a nice mirror finish and probably even cook an egg on it. But you figure, number one, it is going to pick up seasoning. How well is it going to pick up seasoning? Is it still going to look so pristine if the seasoning does not stick? Or is it going to look like that stargazer? <laughs> okay. I have a large Paul Calabresi. I have a large number 14 from the early 90s, and it's machined beautifully. And I'll get stumpy a good home, says Papa Dan. Well, who knows? If the day comes when I get a nice Red Mountain number 14, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, Stumpy, as I said, has is, is done a great job, and uh, and I very much enjoy using old Stumpy. So... Unless I find a Red Mountain number 14, I am not going to uh, give give Stumpy up. <laughs> All right. Time now. Start adding the milk. One, uh, Another one of those things I've had to learn the hard way from experience. You add it a little at a time. You don't dump in two cups of milk all at once. Because, yes, tempering. Because there's... Uh, yeah, and I know there's a lot of science behind it, too. Uh, the reason why, uh, there is a reason why, which I cannot explain right in front of you, why adding a little bit at a time will use less milk to produce a uh, gravy as opposed to dumping in two whole cups at once. So, yes, you do want to just keep adding your milk a little bit at a time. Go ahead. Yes. Well, there is that. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Jamie here says that, you know, if you add it all at once, then you actually have to cook it all at once and reduce it more than say adding just a little bit at a time. See, this looks uh, pretty nice already, doesn't it? Right now, we've just got some very thick hamburger. Um, still going to have to add more yet before we get ourselves some decent gravy. But, oh, yeah, this looks good, and this thing smells good, too. <laughs> what are you calling Stumpy? Oh, Stumpy is my uh, BSR Century number 14 skillet. He is a nice 15-inch behemoth. Look up... Um, Look up, a, I've done him in a, view, in a few videos. If you look it up, you will see Stumpy. 
And there are a couple of reasons why I call him Stumpy. Number one is because it's a huge skillet and the handle is actually uh, pretty short. But also, this particular pan has a casting flaw. And I'm pretty sure this happened right at the uh, factory. I don't think it was broken off because cast iron doesn't break off that way. You'll see that at the end of the at the end of the handle, it's actually there. It's actually a little. There's a divot or whatever it is that uh, prevents the handle from being you know, having a nice round or uh, a nice round um, end. So instead, what we have here, now I'm actually thinking I might have to add a little bit more flour. Uh, because, yeah, it looks like this grease is still coming out. So I may actually have to thicken it just a little bit. Or maybe I should drain some of the grease. Hmm. Let's see. What do we say? Always whole milk or low fat. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing here. What am I cooking up, Jessica T? I am just making some hamburger gravy. Maybe only just a little bit. I'm making some hamburger gravy here to go on top of these hash browns. I also have bread as well, so that we're going to have some SOS, as this video promised in the title. Yeah, there we go. This looks like it's um, helping out. I may actually consider it maybe actually draining out a little bit of this grease, though, because I'm not sure it's going to mix well with the milk. So, give me do, do that, and then I will get back to the subject of unknown cast iron pans because I've uh, given a, sh a couple of looks at this little ugly hammered skillet here, and I would like to say a little bit more about that. Actually, I think it might be uh, working out, so maybe I'll just try the milk again. see how it looks now. Anyway, as I mentioned, in addition to these gate mark pans, there is another rather common vintage unknown cast iron skillet that it's, the, and they made Dutch ovens as well, and they uh, seem to uh, have come more from the northern area of the U.S. So, uh, nonetheless, and that would be, again, the ugly hammered uh, pan. And the reason why they call these things ugly is because they, well, number one, they're very, very heavy and thick. Quite the opposite of these uh, light gate marks, in fact. They also have a very crude design to them. I mean, they, I mean as you can see, the hammered pattern is very simple. Uh, likewise, it has a simple crude number. And what's more, if you, if you ever see a uh, ugly hammered Dutch oven, you will see the underside of that Dutch oven always has a very crude, um, well, circular pattern, like the like the basting marks that or the basting spikes you see in in most other uh, cast iron lids. All right, still debating whether I should try draining out this extra grease that is uh, bubbling here. I think maybe I'll do that, and then we'll and then we'll just add some a little bit more milk yet. I have not really added a lot of milk yet. So, yeah, good. This is nice and cool here. Uh, need this, and yeah, like you said, this thing here has a single pour spout. Yay. Uh, See if I can do this right here. Uh, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But uh, I'm getting a little, whoops, a little bit at least. Uh, I don't think it's working. All right, well, then I'll just have to uh, keep working at it. This is not on, this burner is not on, by the way. So I guess we will throw in a little bit more milk and see if we can turn this mush into gravy. There is an art to making gravy, an art that I am still learning. My gravy is not the best, as you can see right now. 
Although each time it's gotten to this point, I don't think it's looked too badly. So let's just keep adding some, shall we? And what else do we have right now, by the way? Um, okay. Some of the liquid that comes out of ground beef is water, and you don't always have to drain the grease if you want some of that extra fat and flavor. Yeah, that's true. That water is evaporating. You can see the bubbling in there. So, yeah, this is a whole meal. It looks like bills. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> On the other hand, yeah, SOS, well, that's the, one of the reasons why they call it SOS, as you know, shite <laughs> on a shingle. Of course, it tastes very well, and as, you, and as you know, you can't really say that two million army soldiers are wrong. So, let's just throw a little bit more in here yet. See how it turns out now. So far, I've added maybe almost half a cup of flour to this thing. I really don't think I want to do any more for flour. So let's see if we can now get the get this thing really to turn into some gravy. Granted, I mean I could say it's almost like gravy as it is, so I think we might actually be getting somewhere. Okay, as I mentioned, ugly hammered um yeah, pans as well. Um Again, the folks on the Cast Iron Cooking Group and otherwise who have found ugly hammered pans, again, they love them for the reason, the same reason why we like cooking in Lodge or BSR, they are very thick and very heavy, which means they are excellent at retaining heat. So they are really good frying pans in that for that reason. They are, and it's really hard to warp them as well. I mean, not impossible. There are a number of them out there that are warped, but for instance, this uh, number five here is definitely a uh, flat bottom. It's one reason why I like this thing. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, go ahead. All right. That's the other thing about cooking in cast iron, though, and making gravy, and that you always end up with very, very thick gravy. You have to keep really adding uh, milk or liquid again and again and again. And at this point, yeah, we are going to have a big, huge pan full of stuff. All this came from one pound of uh, hamburger. Which again is the reason why you do, why we make this uh, SOS in the first place because it really does good to stretch our uh, food supply and stretch our budget. So yeah, this still has a yellowish tinge to it. I'm thinking because of all of that, uh, all of the butter that went into it. However, this doesn't look too bad as far as gravy goes. That is, I mean, yeah. Here is the part where you can actually look at this thing and say those famous words. You know what that looks like? <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's been used already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's certainly possible, too. I hadn't thought of that. The oil that came off of the potatoes as they cooked. Uh, it's. I'd say it's a nice... Yeah, okay, we can try. Oh, okay. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Because it was all collecting in one spot, so now it's fine anyways. Do you okay. care about eating it? I don't give a shit. No. Part of my language. <laughs> yeah. I don't give a SOS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're see just Besides, this there. is going to go nicely on those uh, hash browns, so. Yeah, even though this is definitely not a creamy gravy, I mean, I'd say we've got a, a something of a consistency. Sorry. Um, all right, I will ask your opinion. Do you think you would want maybe a little more milk in this? I think it's fine, exactly how it is. Like you think it's fine? Oh. Okay. Yeah, then I'll do that. We'll turn off the heat and simply let it thicken that way. Stop stirring the pan because it'll get it out. Yeah, you're you're right. You're right. Okay. It's lumped together right there. It's definitely oil. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It's the cooking oil. Okay. Yeah, it's cooking oil. Well, nonetheless, you know, it's not gonna. We're not gonna die from it. No, not at all. It's just separating the milk. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Even though this is this is the type of thing that Gordon Ramsay would start screaming at you about. Well, this isn't Gordon Ramsay's kitchen. I would never invite him into her anyway. Yeah. My understanding is that in re well, this isn't. Oh, this one you mean? Yeah. yeah my under yeah, yeah. My understanding is in real life, Gordon Ramsay's actually very polite. I mean, he does the whole character bit, of course, for the. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is that. Okay, but anyway, we've got to start here. Once this cools off, in fact, would you like would you like a couple of hash browns? Okay. And Hi, everybody, it, by the way. Yeah. Anyway, as it said, we are not quite done yet anyway. So, Jamie to the rescue, says Papa Dan. No, use, not the rescue. No. Use bread to suck up the oil. Yeah, you've got oh, a point. Oh, shit. That's going to be part of my language. <laughs> so, that's all right. That's all right. I think if you've always seen my brownie video, you are well aware. But all I right. have a problem with uh, continuing my swears. That's okay. My apologies to those more sensitive yes and hey here is the heel of some bread so good what I said good stinking. yeah good thinking good stinking thank you so much for the advice there mm. 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 i still need to add some salt and pepper and worcestershire to it yeah Hmm. Anyway, thank there you, you so much. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, that worked perfect. Whoever suggested that. Mm. Thank you. Mm hmm. Mm. But yeah, here's where we flavor it a little bit. A little more salt. Some pepper. I'm a pepper holic. What can I say? And of course. With sister, 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 Shire sauce. And for me, there's only one Worcestershire sauce, and that would be Leon Perrin's. So there we go. Uh, we are not done yet, though, folks. Um, as I mentioned, I've got, I've uh, mentioned briefly ugly hammered pans. And yeah, this is definitely thickening up. No question about that. I've mentioned ugly hammered pans. I've mentioned the uh, Southern Mystery skillets. Um, of course, you know, there are still um, unknown cast iron pans from the 20th century. Not as many as there used to be. And over the past decade or so, they've done a great job identifying a lot of those uh, unidentified cast iron pans, especially ones from, say, Birmingham Stove and Range, for instance, or ones that may look, that may look like this as well. Namely, this is uh, a fairly common uh, vintage pan, you know, the uh, number in diamond pan. And the belief now is that this was likely produced by Favorite Stove and Range. It's believed to be among the last generation of pans produced by Favorite just after they were acquired or bought out, if you prefer, by Chicago Hardware Foundry in the late 30s. Of course, Chicago Hardware Foundry then went bankrupt themselves in the early 40s, so it was only a few years or so. Nonetheless, um, yeah, because by that time, um, cast iron pans were, of course, you know, becoming more uh, less in the hands of smaller companies, and even then were beginning to move more toward, uh, towards larger companies. Then you can get into things like the antitrust battles of the uh, early 20th century and the like. But still, hey, this isn't bad at all. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm not quite done yet anyway. So let us break out um, the other uh, gate mark skillet we have here. Lucky number seven. And heat this one up. Because I've got one other thing that is going to go on these hash browns here. Okay, but anyway, back to, as I said, back to the subject here. Edmund Boyles, I have a problem with eating while I'm cooking. Yeah, that's really a problem. My bacon tends to get eaten before the rest of my breakfast. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of folks share that problem, yes. <laughs> It's yard sale season, so I'll be hunting for the iron. Yeah, the yard sales are uh, out in bloom. 
Um, I mean, I know we've got our social distancing, so be careful. And unfortunately, it's because of that that Brimfield has uh, is still closed. Although they're adopting a wait and see whether or not they might excuse me, they might uh, open up in July. And I hope I certainly hope they do. But yard sales are still around. Um, and the flea markets as well. Yeah, we probably lost a lot of cast iron from the war effort. Oh, definitely, no question about that. And and actually, if you think it was bad here in the U.S., it was much worse in Europe. That is the main reason why vintage cast iron is practically extinct in Europe. I mean, they were obviously in much more desperate straits, and so just about everything was recycled for uh, for the war effort there in. On the other hand, yes, a lot of unknown pans um, and a lot of known pans were, you know, were used in the uh, war effort here in the U.S. Because you figure they were what were they? They were frying pans. I mean, who cared about an old rusty frying pan when you could always get another one? So, as a result, scrap metal drives uh, a lot of times did include kitchen cookware, especially iron. And that is one reason why I have come to the conclusion that the large single notch skillet in particular is uh, a lot more rare for that reason. Not only because it was only produced for a shorter period of time, as opposed to the three notch skillet, you know, was produced like from the third, no, from the forties all the way up to like the eighties or so. But you figure that Lodge was, number one, affected by the Great Depression. And so uh, they didn't produce as much uh, cookware in those days, uh, Those days, although they did actually uh, expand and their uh, production and uh, produce a whole lot of other items um, to uh, help, you know, help stay in business. But uh, between that and, as you said, the war effort when a lot of cast iron pans were recycled, that would be, those are my two reasons why I feel that the large single knot skillet is uh, a lot less common and one worth actually grabbing if you can find it at a decent price. I mean, it is a large skillet and large skillets are great, but... The, I mean, really, the only reason why I would think folks would want a single notch skillet in particular would be for the collector value. I mean, a three notch skillet, for instance, is a great uh, cooker in itself. And uh, I have a um, 1940s uh, three notch skillet myself. I also do have a number five single notch lodge. So, I'm, and I'm happy to own that one too. This thing here is still heating up i'm hoping only a couple more minutes or so and then we will do one other uh, bit of very fast and easy cooking and meanwhile let me just finish off this little bit of bread here too mm. Mm hmm oh yeah that is some uh, really nice even though it looks disgusting sos there hmm. Papa Dan, compliments to the Facebook, to the Cast Iron Cooking Group. They're, yeah, they are as nice and friendly. Um, well, yeah. And the real fun part is really keeping that group of over 400,000 people focused and on topic. So a lot of the credit for that goes to the moderators of the Cast Iron Cooking Group. And I'm glad, and I'm more than happy to say that. So <laughs> the war effort is what happens to the lids. You're not kidding. They need the skillet, but not the lids. Yes, indeed. Jacob, uh, again, in Canada, we can't buy anything unless it's essential. I haven't been searching for cast iron at garage sales. We'll be looking forward to it. And the best I can say is uh, the best of luck to that. So, um, Bookworm73, I picked up a single notch recently for cheap. I've only seen a few. Yeah, that's the type of thing where if it's cheap, I mean, if, as you say, well, go ahead and grab it. Because at worst, well, uh, unless you want, unless you do want a collection of display items, at worst, you know, you could always donate one of your other pans to family or friends or the like and use that single notch skillet or the other way around. I mean, after all, you didn't pay a lot of money for it. So would it really be so bad to give that single notch as a gift? No, not to me. I mean, to, uh, you know, again, to family and fr or friends, for instance. 
They may not appreciate its value as much as you do, though. <laughs> um, I would have thought that Teflon was the biggest cast iron killer. And in a way, you are correct. Uh, really, the entire market, the entire economy changed in the post-World War II era. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, both internal and external. Yes, there was competition, of course, from foreign cast iron makers. You know, that's when China and Japan started flooding our market with cheap products, which they continue to do up through today, as well as uh, the cast iron manufacturers themselves found that other American-made goods, in particular nonstick pans, had really, really become popular really fast and drove a lot of the uh, markets underground. And that's the main reason why Griswold and Wagner, for instance, uh, really held on as long as they could, but could not make it. You could even say that about BSR, Birmingham Stoven Range. They really went out of business because, well, they were in dire straits. You know, they could not afford to stay in business. And then the blame for that can be pointed everywhere. It can be pointed at us as well as abroad. And that's just how it is. So... <laughs> Uh, but yes, now Teflon and nonstick, yeah, that's another story in itself. No, I don't like nonstick pans, only be largely because, you know, I learned, as I said, I've been cooking for the last 10 years, and I learned how to cook in cast iron, and I enjoy it. And I think we are hot enough at this point that we can pull out one other thing to, uh, you know, to uh, quickly fry up in this pan, and that would be some cheese. Yeah, I figure topping uh, one or two of these uh, hash browns with some actual fried cheese would certainly be worth it. And incidentally, if you've never had fried cheese and you've only had grilled cheese sandwiches, you definitely it's definitely worth your while to go out and try some of this. What I found out is that you need a particular type of cheese to do this because... <laughs> A rapidly melting cheese will do just that. If you throw it in the pan, it will, of course, just melt and become a blob. On the other hand, some some brands of cheese are uh, hardy enough or strong or um, tough enough that you that um, you can actually fry them and they will stay in shape. Speaking of staying in shape, there. How do you open this thing? There we go. I guess. Okay, which is why. I am uh, very uh, struggling to get this stupid package off. And then once we do that, we will very quickly fry up some cheese because it really, it only takes about a minute or so to do this. Uh, come on, you, you so-and-so. All right, almost got this thing out of the pan, so out of the package. Once again, as always, thank you everybody for your patience. But as I said, the subject for tonight was, and still is, unknown cast iron pans, most of which seem to date from the 19th century to the early uh, 20th century, because by then, after that, of course, the market became, you know, less, you know, more dominated by bigger business, which, of course, is something that you can say even has only gotten worse over time. But again, that's just how it goes. So, let's see if we can do this right here. I think we will do it this way. I'm just... Uh, yeah, there we go. Let me move this over just a bit so you can see what's going on here. Uh, enough to uh, fit on these... Um, there we go. Enough to fit on these hash browns. Now, here, let's quickly get a little bit of oil. This time I am using oil. Yeah. Pull this out nice and quick. And away we go. One and two. All you need to do is fry these things for about maybe 30 seconds per side at the most. That's all you need to have fried cheese. So this is nice and quick and easy. <laughs> Fried cheese is amazing. So salty. 
Uh, pink tooth. I recently saw a cow starting a can that had two painted fried eggs on it being sold as a wall hanger decoration. Oh yeah, I've, I've seen that. Um, I've never heard of it. New one on me. Well, yeah, this is this again is another thing I learned from being a, from when I was living in a uh, Portuguese neighborhood. In fact, I have a problem. Not sure if this is done. I may have wanted to uh, set just a second or two longer. But still, well, no, I better not because even now the cheese is starting to melt. But it does hold its shape long enough. Let me move this back this way. It does hold its shape long enough for you to uh, quickly fry it up. And as I said, it only takes about a minute or so. And it's really as easy as that. I think I could probably even flip it one more time. Oh, yeah, no, that's too soon. I'm impatient. My bad. So let's just hold tight here. I still have this up on medium for the record. Uh, us cast iron lovers should be glad that the lodge has survived and it's still producing great products. Yes, bought a walk after watching and... And I and I love it. Well, I'm glad to hear that pop on Dan. Walks are great. Yeah, we make popcorn in it multiple times a week. Yeah, that's one of the good things about a cast iron walk. One of many that is. Um, but yeah, um, I had, as I mentioned, I had done, I had cooked last week in a South African poiki, and they are in that exact situation of what it might be like if Lodge went out of business. You know. Um, before the uh, cast iron renaissance, that is. Um, namely, in South Africa, the very last manu local manufacturer of cast iron, the Falkirk Company, they did go out of business. And so as a result, in South America, if you want a uh, cast iron poiki, and they are still quite popular, all of them are now uh, imported in, usually from Asia. So there is no choice because all of the local manufacturers are gone. And yes, if Lodge had gone out of business, we would be in the same situation ourselves. Have, uh, doing nothing, of course, but hunting down vintage cast iron pans, which, of course, is what we're doing. But if it's doubtful that um, there would have even been a cast iron renaissance for the last couple of decades, for the last 10 years or so, if Lodge had, in fact, gone out of business. I mean, after all, there would be no market model that would suggest that a cast iron manufacturer <coughs> excuse me, would be successful at all in the U.S. So that's one, re one reason why I am I'm very much a fan of, of Lodge Cast Iron. But the biggest reason is because I love Lodge Cast Iron pans. I think they are wonderful for cooking. And I will gladly say that Lodge is still the best quality cast iron you can get to modern day, that is, at a, at a reasonable premium price. So, yeah, there we go. We've got some nice fried cheese. And onto that, add a little bit hamburger gravy. Hmm. Oops, I think I goofed. And yeah, that as as you know, this is SOS. Really disgusting looking, but boy, does it taste good. <laughs> and we have mentioned a few things, as I said, about uh, unknown cast iron pans, namely that they are great cookers. You can often find them at a, a really good bargain if you're lucky, um, because of course a lot of the sellers don't even know what they have. I say again, don't go on eBay because they have a sometimes have an idea of what they have, but eBay in general is far, far overpriced. But the vintage cast iron hunt is can take a long time. It can take years. You may never find that one pan you are really looking for, but you probably will at some point or another. You just don't know what it is. <laughs> Because, hey, I mean, I certainly was not expecting, for instance, to come across a Wagner chicken fryer, which I found at Brimfield, or a, um, let me see, what else? Um, or even a Wagner uh, uh, double broiler lid, 
which I found for five dollars just a couple of weeks ago at a uh, flea at a uh, flea market, in fact. Or my BSR number twelve, which I again found at a flea market. So who knows? It can happen. I mean, I will say in one time or another at a uh, local flea market here in the town I'm living in, I once found a WAPIC number 12 and paid $3 for it. So you never know. <laughs> Hi, Fluffy. I'm going to try pizza soon. My husband loves SOS. And yeah, we've got plenty of this to go around. Come on over and have some. <laughs> Andrew Bonificio, the kitchen is mine, and the wife knows it. <laughs> well, hey, she's got a guy who cooks, so that's not so bad either. Fluffy Otter, my large cast iron pan makes great pizza crust, better than my Wagner. Yeah, because it's thicker, I have no doubt about that. That's a lot of cheese, yes, indeed. I will admit, I think I might have maybe uh, made the cheese a little bit too thick. But, on the other hand, Whoever said that there was such a thing as too much cheese? So, I can only appreciate everybody for showing up, as as always. I mean, again, we did touch on, as I said, some of the unknown UFOs, unidentified frying objects that can be found out there. Um, and, well, what can you say? They're, the truth is out there, which, again, is another reason to cue the X-Files theme. Because, uh, as you know, this really comes from the joy of the hunt. You never know what you're going to find. Maybe nothing, yeah, but every so often, it's, you're likely to come across a surprising score. And it, and it happens, it seems like, to just about everybody who has patience. You know, they usually say, I've, came, I've been looking all of these times. I see these great scores on the internet, on the Facebook group, and I never find one myself until today. And you never know when it'll happen. Maybe it'll be at an estate sale or a yard sale or a flea market. Hell, maybe there might even be a, uh, you know, a, a scrap yard near your area, and you might actually salvage something out of that. Anything could happen. And having said all that, uh, NDN Pride, well, thank you very much. And again, thank you, everybody, for showing up, as always. So, yeah. Got one of those sizzler pans at Hecht Company, too. 1979 for $16. I, I can't believe some of the cast iron I find. And all I can say to everybody for that is good hunting. So <laughs> my wife is just fine with the kitchen being mine. I don't blame her. <laughs> Cooking is a lot of work. It's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work because I'm going to have to clean up this mess, too. And having said that, and I'd say we've about approached the, the time anyway, so I can only, again, appreciate everybody who's shown up here. And I'm really pleased, this is the third week in a row, that we've not had any major glitches here. I'm hoping I haven't jinxed it by saying that. Thank you for the reminder, by the way, to plug in the Ethernet cable. <laughs> Enjoy the SOS and, and everybody else, too. You all, you all folks have uh, a lot of fun cooking. And as always, I guess the best thing we can say now is thank you very much for watching, everyone, and see you next Wednesday.